Our scripture for today comes from Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 through 26. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from a flow of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that moment. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread through all of that district. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Matthew sandwiches his stories. The bread of the sandwich is one story, and the story is interrupted by a second story. The filling, right, the stuff of the sandwich. Our story for today begins and ends with a story about Jesus uh, raising a dead girl back to life, which requires the humble and strong interruption of her father. And as Jesus follows the father to his daughter's corpse, he is interrupted by a woman who has been suffering from bleeding, from hemorrhages. There is a variation of these stories in Mark's Gospel, which Amy Jill Levine explores in her chapter but we're going to stick with Matthew for our purposes. The woman, seeing Jesus, came up behind him and, being a bit of a trickster, touched the fringes of his cloak, his talit, which is a fringed garment worn as a prayer shawl by religious Jews, the fringes of which are there to serve as visual reminders of the Torah, of the commandments of the Lord. The talit was a tangible object which held real powerful for Jews, real reminding power. Jesus was among Gentiles at the time, so we can assume that the hemorrhaging woman was also Gentile, but perhaps she was familiar with this Jewish practice. But even if she wasn't, she had heard of Jesus's power. Word of his reputation had spread throughout the B region, and she was confident of his power his wild holiness, as Amy Jill Levine names it. The hemorrhaging woman was so confident in his wild holiness that she was sure that even if she only touched the fringe of his cloak, she would be saved. She would get her life back. Amy Jill Levine sees this moment as evidence for one way that we have viewed Jesus through time, which was first explored in Jewish Christian liturgy as the tree of life. In the Garden of Eden, which God planted, as told in Genesis 2, there are two trees in the midst of it, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. When the humans are placed there in the garden, God gives them one direction. You can eat from any tree in the garden except from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for you will surely die. In Genesis 3, the serpent plants a seed of doubt in Eve's mind. Did God really say that you would die if you ate from any tree in the garden? And then the serpent lies. You will not die. Eve reaches out, perhaps hesitantly, or at least with some seed of doubt in her mind about God, about reality. But she reaches out to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. She takes a piece of fruit and shares it with her husband, Adam. And when they eat, their perspective changes and they become ashamed of their bodies. Part of the fallout of this shame for women is named as pain in childbirth. Birthing children becomes laborious and a cause of physical suffering. 
there's an image that captures the theological idea that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is the new Eve. Eve has her head down in the image with the serpent wrapped around her leg. And Mary reaches out to lift Eve's chin, a sign of restored dignity. And the serpent is now crushed under the pregnant Mary's foot. The idea is that Mary's birth of the Messiah, Mary's yes to God, Mary's obedience and lack of shame had restored all that was broken in Eve. But the story of the hemorrhaging woman makes me wonder if the hemorrhaging woman might also be a new Eve, Eve's foil. If Jesus is the tree of life and the woman who is bleeding reaches out to touch just the fringes of his cloak, just the outer leaves of his tree, with the confidence that she will gain her life there, does that, that not restore the misdirection of Eve? Eve could choose to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil or the tree of life and she chose the knowledge of good and evil. Eve could choose to get all of her questions answered, or she could choose life. And she chose to get her questions answered at great cost to herself and every generation after her. The hemorrhaging woman, whose bleeding may have been caused by childbirth, had been trying to get life from the tree of knowledge of good and evil trying to get a diagnosis, trying to get healing for her suffering, but all that she could get from physicians was an answer, a reason why she was bleeding. The right answer, a reason for her suffering, did not give her any life, any salvation from her suffering. After having eaten from the tree that only brought about continued suffering, that didn't cultivate or support life abundant, the hemorrhaging woman decided to chase after life. And this guy, Jesus, he had it. He was saving people from their suffering, left and right. He was overflowing with the power of life. The Jesus tree had an overabundance of life fruit. And she was going to seek after it no matter what. What is so powerful about the idea of a new Eve in Mary or in the hemorrhaging woman or whomever else restores those, those first missteps is that whatever generational curses, whatever patterns, whatever social constructs or inequities that we attribute to Eve, that we blame Eve for, no longer have to have a hold over us. That's the gospel truth. The powers of the serpent, the powers of the world, the forces that hold us back, they can be defeated. The patriarchy, the sexism, the suffering, the death, the mental toil of constantly seeking answers to unanswerable questions, it can all be defeated. And people like Mary or the hemorrhaging woman, they clear the path a little bit for that to be realized. The hemorrhaging woman shows us that Although the sexism of the disciples and possibly of Jesus might have tried to get in the way of her salvation if she asked for it to their face, her courage and her confidence, her heart, her sense of self-worth found a way to get it anyway. Although Herod had tried to kill all the infant boys in Judea, Mary found a way to undermine his efforts and escape to Egypt in order that Jesus might make a way for death to be defeated once and for all. In order that a path might be cleared for each one of us into eternal life. I have questions about whether it was bad for Eve to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't know that it was. But what I think that this story of the hemorrhaging woman helps us to see in Eve's story is that when the options are answers or life, it is disordered thinking to pick answers. Our life is the most precious thing we have. Our life is sacred. The life of others is the most sacred thing on earth. 
and to pick answers over life is disordered in some way. Curiosity and wonder in and of themselves are not bad. But to place their importance over the sacred nature of life is unethical, and it creates suffering and death. When I entered high school, I also entered into the most severe depression of my life. After months and months of only wearing sweatpants to school, infrequent showers, and it requiring profound inertia to just get up off the couch, my mom took me to my doctor. After telling the doctor of my numbness, disinterest, dissociation, and other symptoms, the doctor turned to my mom, who was in the room with me, and gave her an answer. The depression is hormonal. This is normal for 14-year-olds. She'll grow out of it. She was correct, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The doctor had the right answer. Time did change my experience, and my sophomore year was a lot better than the year before, mentally at least. It probably was related to my changing hormones. But the answer didn't help me at all. There was nothing in her words to my mother, which, you know, her words were not to me, the one suffering. There's nothing in her words that saved me. In the midst of suffering, knowing that all that the suffering will probably end someday isn't very hopeful and it didn't make me feel any better. We don't always have a way to cure other people's suffering. I don't know if my doctor had any way to cure my suffering or to relieve me of physical or mental or emotional pain. But we can notice when people are asking for help, when they are advocating for themselves, even making a show of it, trying to get help through the side door, we can respond in some way that lifts up their spirits. We can reach out and lift up their chins and restore their dignity. We can say, I see your courage. I see your confidence. I see your worth as a human being. I see the life within you. And that is what will save you. Your pursuit of life is the vigor in you. It is the vitality. Life itself is coursing through you. And that life is what will defeat the death-dealing forces that are trying to hold you back. Every time you thrash and claw and crawl towards salvation, towards life, you clear a path for others to follow. Your seeking is faith, and it gives all who follow behind you a path to follow. So I invite you, in response to my story and the story of the hemorrhaging woman, to share your own stories with one another. They might start like this. I fought for life when... Or... I wanted answers when. I hope you will receive one another's stories with curiosity and grace. Your stories are God's stories. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>